All right, so um, glad to see everybody here again. Uh, how many of you here for the first time tonight? You missed last week? There's a handful of you, yes. Uh, so glad you came, and then glad that the rain didn't scare too many people away this evening. This uh, one this evening is going to get uh, deep into uh, Greek, and um, there's just no other way to avoid it. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to need your patience and I'm going to try to do my best to make this semi-entertaining as much as you can with a tough topic like this. This is, of course, our overall topic. We're talking about how we got worship wrong. Uh, we talked about that last week and there's a little bit of a uh, scope of where we're going to be dealing with the next seven weeks. We'll talk about that at the end of this, just to remind you where we're going after this. Uh, last week, though, when we recapped what we talked about, uh, the reason that they didn't call going to church uh, a worship service back in the first century was they, uh, they first of all didn't describe them as worship, which is a mind-boggling idea. Secondly, they didn't describe their meetings as services, which also is a mind-boggling idea. It was to me. They also saw their meetings as gatherings and not really as formal ceremonial events like we tend to do. Uh, and all this comes from my, my uh, doctoral dissertation where I just got into this kind of thing in so much detail for two and a half years that I really don't even want to talk about it anymore. But this, still, this stuff is so significant. Somebody's got to talk about this. And also the, the third, fourth reason why they uh, didn't call their early assemblies as worship services is because they were primarily horizontally focused with one another as opposed to vertically focused as you're gathering together to do something for God. Uh, the more I've thought about this, it seems that God's doing just fine without us doing much of anything. But what really needs work is one another. And that seems to be what the New Testament is talking about when it starts to discuss in some detail what we do when we get together. <clears throat> so tonight is the real meaning of worship in the Bible. And in order to do that, we got to talk about Greek words. Because if somebody asks me, what do I believe about worship? I have to ask this question. Well, which, which kind of worship are you talking about? <clears throat> are you talking about proskuneo worship? Lachuo worship? Later, get o worship, sebo my worship, or are you talking about threskeia worship? I know you don't know what those words mean, but that's what's really going on in the New Testament because all five of these Greek words are translated as worship. And they all had unique, distinct meanings. None of them are synonymous. And yet when we throw the word worship at them, when English Bible translators throw the English word worship at them so that you read it in your Bible, it really gets confusing to, to us. When we hear the word worship, we immediately think of, well, that's what we do when we go to church. We're offering stuff up to God, singing, praying, uh, with the, 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 uh, all the praise and worship music going on and worship bands, that's what we're thinking of. But interestingly enough, none of these words mean that. We're gonna talk about some of the more uh, significant words on this list. The question has to be asked to begin with, how do you determine what a Greek word means when it's found in the Bible? I mean, you can't just, there wasn't some Greek to English dictionary that somebody dug up from the first century so that you can always tell what these words mean. One reason why that didn't happen is because the language of English didn't exist in the first century. That makes the problem a little bit more harder, right? We're trying to translate an ancient Greek word into a very modern language uh, with a different culture behind each one of them. So context determines meaning. From the guys who work with this kind of thing are called lexicologists. They work uh, on lexicons, which are dictionaries. They, they determine how do you determine the meaning of words? One of my uh, Greek professors in my doctoral program made a statement in class and it just blew me away and I hadn't forgotten it. And I always remember it. 
when he's talking about this issue about what do Greek words mean today? He said, context determines meaning and nothing else. It's true in all languages, he said. Even if you're trying to figure out what a Japanese word means, a Swahili word, a German, French, English, Hebrew or Greek, the context in which a word is found, in the sentence in which it is found, starts to give you clues as to what that word means, even in our own language. So operating from this basic fundamental principle that context determines meaning, determines meaning then we can start to, to look to, at, at all these Greek words, look at all the contexts in which they are found in the New Testament, and it's a lot of work, and then you can start to come to some good solid conclusions. Now it is true, there are things known as lexicons, Greek to English lexicons today. I have a, at least six of them in my, in my library. Uh, one of them is nine volumes long, Kittles, maybe you have that one. Uh, I have another one that's five volumes long, it's thousands of pages. Uh, somebody's done a lot of work to try to figure out what all these Greek words mean. But even those guys who wrote that, those books can be wrong. How is it possible that they could write 2,000 pages and be perfectly correct on all 2,000 pages with all 3,000 words or whatever it is they're defining? What I found out as I got deeper into this topic, especially with our first word, which is proskuneo, um, something's not right there. And I began to learn that uh, the lexicons and the Greek experts and the Bi English Bible translators have got these words wrong. And I know that's a big statement to make, but I hope to uh, maybe actually prove some of that tonight. Uh, when you look at the word worship, the English word worship, as it is found in the New American Standard New Testament, I think they've got it like 70 times, it appears in the New Testament. Three quarters of the time, if you can see the, this part of the, the pie chart, it's the word proskuneo, which is what we're going to talk about first. All the others only make up 25% of the time that the word worship is found. So proskuneo becomes very important to our study. Here's another pie chart. When you look at all the times that proskuneo is found in the Greek New Testament, 87% of the time, your typical English translation has translated that word as worship. The other times, it's generally something like bow down. It seems like those are two different things, right? Bowing down and worshiping? What could they possibly have in common? Uh, to cut to the quick, I'm finding that that is the real meaning of this word, and we'll talk about that in some detail. When you try to figure out what one of these words means in the New Testament, fortunately we have an Old Testament. I guess it's true the Old Testament was written mostly in Hebrew, but in the first century, the Bible that Jesus used and Paul and Peter and John was a Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint. And so you have this big volume of an Old Testament, which actually has more books in it than the Protestant Bible does. It's more closer to the Catholic Bible and its canon. You had this massive volume of data, massive amount of times that these words are found that you can go and look in the context of all those times in the Old Testament where the word is found in the Greek Old Testament and begin to learn even more about these words. It's found 204 times in the Greek Old Testament and 61 times in the Greek New Testament. We're talking about the word proskuneo here. In the Old Testament, the question comes up then, if you find this word proskuneo 204 times in the Old Testament, what word, what is the Hebrew word that the Septuagint translators translated into proskuneo? And it actually becomes a very useful study to figure this out because every time it's this word, hava, uh, 
Hishtachava is how it would be pronounced in its usual form found in the Old Testament. Now, I apologize if I spit on you, Gary, there, but I said that this is, I mean, that's how the, the Hebrew words go. Uh, so the question then becomes, well, what does that word mean? Hava. And interestingly enough, it means to bow down and prostrate yourself. If you look at like the, the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew lexicon, which is just one of several, and I have several in my library as well, uh, this was produced about 100 years ago. It's been updated by Holiday, and I have that one as well. And they all agree that it means this 100% of the time, not 13%, 100% of the times when Chava is found in the Old Testament, it means to prostrate yourself. Interesting. And they put it in three different settings. The first is bowing down or prostrating yourself in front of a monarch or somebody who is superior to you. I'm going to talk about prostration, getting down on your nose, basically. Uh, also doing it before God. And you also find people doing this act of prostration before other gods. These three contexts. But for our purposes, the one that's the most important is when it appears before God. Because well, all what we're concerned about, well, what then is worship to God? You know, it, we think of worship as something you do to God, right? So what is what is proskuneo to God mean? Well, I've looked up all the 204 times it's found in the New Testament with incredible detail. I should have been shot somewhere in the middle of that process because it is, it is, I was, I stuck on this for several months working at the, looking at all these times it was found and it was uh, mind blowing. It, the issue of prostration raises the question, well, what is prostration? Now, as you can see this, this is an etching on an ancient carving. Uh, you can see a man down on hands and knees uh, uh, bowing, he's prostrating. The word proskuneo is sometimes translated with a transliterated English word called proskinesis. He's performing proskinesis. I know we say he's worshiping, but what he's really doing is bowing down. He's, he's prostrating himself. It was a common thing done, whether it's to a monarch again, to God or to other gods. This is what the word does. Now in the Mishnah, which is rabbinical writings that uh, actually span hundreds of years. This is one of the older statements in the Mishnah about Hishtachava, which is Hava, the, the Hebrew word. Uh, this particular rabbi writing around 200 AD said, Hishtachava, this is prostrating oneself while spreading one's arms and legs in total submission. It's my best impression of a rabbi. I think. Uh, but it's, it's getting down like this. So the, 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 the Jews needed, knew that they needed to define what this is. Because it's absolutely required in the Old Testament. No question about it. And it's found, as I said, 204 times. And every time it means this. And people are doing it to God all the time. So it's important to even define. And the rabbis would get into great detail on exactly how this is done. Uh, several hundred years later, here's another rabbi, Rabbi Moses ben Maimon, in, in also in the Mishnah. He says, prostrating, how is it done? There, it's starting to come out again. <laughs> <laughs> After he raises his head from the fifth bow, he sits on the ground and falls upon his face to the ground. The bowing referred to everywhere in the Bible, that is, is upon the knees. The keda bow, however, is on the nose. Interesting. I don't want you to get the impression that this is exactly what was going on in the Bible when you see this word, which you probably won't see this word because what you're going to see most of the time is the word worship. But you can pretty much tell sometimes when you look up your Old Testament and New Testament and you see the word worship, just see in your mind if prostration fits the context and you'll find that it often does. So this is uh, the the. the gesture of prostration would change from culture to culture and from time to time. It would evolve through the years uh, in the Middle East. We see some of this in popular culture today. This is a little dark of a photo, but there's Queen Elizabeth, uh, and she's got somebody coming up before her, and he's, of course, on his knees, and he's before a monarch. So even though they're not trying to do biblical proskinesis, yet some 
elements of this ancient cultural gesture still exist today, even in the English-speaking world. Here's another photo. I don't know if you can see this very well. It's kind of dark, but this is Lady Gaga. And she's bowing before Queen Elizabeth. I think she thinks it's pretty funny uh, in this case. <laughs> but when, when, and you notice just a couple of weeks ago, Queen Elizabeth died and Pr Prince Charles becomes King Charles. And then people now who come up to him, they're, they're, they're bowing down. And when, when they leave the presence of the king, they're backing away, never turning your back to the, to the monarch. Well, all this comes from this Middle Eastern cultural uh, habit. And that is what uh, proskuneo is. Now, there's also, in the movie Aladdin, there's, I'm going to play just a little excerpt from it. Uh, Marilyn, just be ready. There's a speaker right in front of you. I hope this isn't too loud. You might remember this part of this song from Aladdin. Oh, you got to play it all over again. Here we go. Okay, you get the idea. Uh, great movie, by the way. I love it. Uh, what amazes me about this, these lyrics, they're using some language and some words that we don't use. Prince Ali, fabulous, Ali Ababa, genuflect. You may know what that is. I think it comes from bending your knee is what it literally means. Uh, show some respect down on one knee. Now, of course, in the Bible times, they're going down on both knees. Uh, but try your best to stay calm. Brush up your Sunday salam. Now, we don't use this word, salam, but it, it, it's referring to prostration. Your Sunday salam is your prostration. Now, when this movie was remade with Will Smith as Aladdin just three, four years ago, they changed the lyrics on this because there is no such thing as a Sunday salam. He sings, brush up your Friday salam because when Muslims go into the mosque, one thing they do is, of course, they salam, they proskinesis, they do prostration, uh, but they do it on Friday, and nobody does it on Sunday. So it, that, this was sort of a, an anachronistic mistake made by the original writers of this song, which I don't need to get into any more, more than that. But this is, this is basically what you're talking about when you're talking about a prostration. That's an image I grabbed off the internet, and it's probably as close as I, I think was uh, in existence in the first century in the Middle East, in, in biblical culture. Here's another image. This is from, I think, a, a possibly a Greek Orthodox church or some Orthodox church where the people who are being ordained to the clergy are uh, prostrated, full-blown prostration, hands out, legs out, nose to the ground. Uh, have you, any of you ever seen this happen before? Uh, there's a couple hands going up, yes. Uh, and it, it's a sign of great respect great humility and submission, which biblical prostration did all of that as well. Uh, one more photo. This is probably something you're more uh, familiar, that's more familiar to you. These are Muslims performing prostration in a mosque. They're required to do this. Uh, another finding I learned while doing this study was that the word mosque comes from the Arabic word masjid, which means a place of prostration. Now we talk about having places of worship. They have a place of worship, but they know what they know that worship actually means prostration. Now I'm not saying <laughs> that they've got it right, we've got it wrong. But, Everybody's got it wrong, so it's just a degree of a matter of degree, I guess. So, but this is prostration. So I think we're getting this fully in our head now, right? When I went through these 204 times that the word is found in the Old Testament, I noticed, and in the New Testament, I found several prostration indicators in the context of when this word proskuneo was found. So like in a sentence. 
if the word proskuneo is there, you look at the words that accompany it, and then you begin to get an idea of what the word itself, proskuneo, means. And here's some of them. First off, the word itself is something of an indication of, of prostration. Pros, kuneo. Pros is a common Greek prefix that means toward or to. When we have a lot of words that mean prefixes that carry some meaning to, like prefixes. Pre means before. So it's fixed before. Well, pros kuneo means it's, you do this to somebody or toward. There's a very directional aspect to pros kuneo. You'll see why here in a minute. Another prostration indicator is when the word appears with the word fall down. It's the Greek word pipto in, in, the, in the Greek. It, often you see people falling down and worshiping is how it's translated, but they're falling down and prostrating. It's what they're doing. This Matthew 2.11, when the, the magi, the three kings come to see Jesus, the baby Jesus, they perform, they fall down and prostrate. Fall down and worship is how it's translated, but I think it's a bad translation. Uh, it's found 21 times, this combination of falling down and prostrating yourself in the Old Testament and 12 times in the New Testament. That many times is mind-blowing to me. Here's another prostration indicator. People fall on their knees and do proskinesis. It's another indication, again, we're talking about prostration. I mean, what, how Why do you have to be on your knees to worship? Well, you have to be on your knees to perform proskinesis. Uh, another one, by the way, it's found 17 times in the Old Testament. Mark 15 also has that reference. Sometimes people fall on their face, biblically. And then the word prostration appears again. Proskuneo appears then. Revelation is several times in Revelation. But 29 times in the Old Testament, three times in the New, people are falling on their face, and then this word is found. It's an indicator that it should not be translated as worship. It should be translated as prostrating yourself. I mean, fall, you're on your face, you're on your knees, you're on the ground, which is actually you fall on the ground. The ground is often mentioned in conjunction with the word prostration or proskuneo. Genesis 18, too, is a good example of that. 33 times people are on the ground when they perform uh, this act. Sometimes it says people fall at the feet of the person so honored. Now, that's not always before God. Sometimes it is, but sometimes at the feet of, of a king. Uh, and this is found five times in the Old Testament, five in the New. So sometimes also, and actually several times, the word come appears before prostrate. You come and worship is what we say, but what it means biblically, you come and you prostrate. The idea, it's about 43 times, 43 times in the uh, uh, Old Testament. In order, you, you don't just drop down anywhere and perform prostration. <coughs> you do it in front of the person or entity, deity, uh, that you want to honor with the act. It is something done before them, which is the next thing. The word before often appears with prostration. You prostrate before the person you're doing this to. That's also found several times uh, throughout uh, scripture. So when you see all these prostration indicators uh, tossed in with the word proskuneo, you know it means worship. Ironically, your English Bibles don't translate it that way, even though I don't see any other way to translate it when you have this kind of evidence right in the context. How, how can you do that? Uh, you can think of uh, some songs uh, to come and worship. Uh, isn't there some Christmas song, come and worship, come and worship, cry, worship Christ the newborn king? Uh, pardon my singing, but that's, uh, uh, that is a biblical phrase, come and worship, but it's come and prostrate. You have to come into the presence of whether it's God in the temple or whatever, and you got to do that. Here's some examples, like from uh, ones from the, just in the Old Testament, Genesis 42. You're familiar with the movie Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Well, Joseph's brothers came 
and prostrated to him, proskinesis, with their faces to the ground. So you get these prostration indicators of coming, and then their face is on the ground. Uh, I don't know how else you can translate this. Now, they won't, the English Bibles will not translate this as worship, because they don't want to have anybody worshiping some other humans. But when this word appears before God, they will always change it and say they're, they're worshiping. Uh, like uh, This example in, in the New Testament, this is again is from the, uh, the Magi, the three wise men who travel from afar to see the baby Jesus. After they came, there's the coming, into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they fell down and the translation is worshiped him, but they prostrated to him. The word to is also there in the Greek inherently, which you worshiped to Jesus or to him? No, they prostrated to him. They're on the ground, they're on their face. That They've come to get in his presence to do this. It, it means prostration, as all the Hebrew lexicons know. This was a very interesting, when I found this reference, it blew me away. There's a guy named Herodotus, was a, a Greek from the fifth century BC, and he was traveling through Persia, modern day Iran. Uh, and he was writing of his experiences in seeing this other culture and how they do things. And he said, the Persians, if two Persians who are equal greet one another, they kiss each other on the lips. That's what you do if you're equal in that culture. If there's a slight difference in rank, the cheek is kissed. We see this in some cultures today as well. But if the difference in rank is great, says Herodotus, the person of lower stature falls down and prostrates himself. This is a good, helpful clue into the cultural aspect of proskinesis and prostration. That's it's a greeting, which I think that's my next point. Or, or was that my point at the top? Of it? Yes, proskuneo is a greeting. It's a way either you greet uh, people of greater stature, or it's the way you also greet God. The, uh, the, it becomes important now to define if proskuneo appears in a temple context, does it mean worship or does it mean prostration? Well, here's an interesting passage from Ezekiel 46. This one also, when I found this, I, uh, this was great to help me. The prince shall enter, this is sort of like coming, enter the temple by way of the porch of the gate from outside, and he stands by the post of the gate. Then he shall, now the translation in English is worship, but then he shall prostrate at the threshold of the gate and then go out. The people of the land shall also Worship, no, prostrate at the doorway of that gate before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, on the Sabbath and on the new men's, and, and, and they go out. What's, what's going here is something of a, uh, a traffic control situation. All these people were required to come to the temple and perform their obligatory prostration to God. I'll talk about that in just a minute, but when you have a long line of hundreds if not thousands of people who need to perform their obligatory ritual prostration before God, you come in, there's the spot where you're down, then get up and get out. We got a bunch of people behind you, so don't waste time. Uh, sometimes you may see on TV uh, where Muslims are going to uh, Mecca and there's these massive crowds of people, you gotta control what's going on and get them moving. Well here, this is what's going on in Ezekiel 46. Um, so it's, it's a temple greeting. Once they, cr let me back up to this thing again. He says, well, they're, they're at the gate. They're coming in through the gate that makes you officially enter the temple. Once you're on the temple grounds, then you're in the presence of God. And the only thing you can do is to prostrate yourself. It's the proper way to greet your God, to appear before him. Here's another passage, 2 Kings 19. This was interesting. As Sennacherib was prostrating, again, your translation and your Bible would say worshiping, in the house of Nisroch, his god, Adramelech and Sherezer killed him with the sword. Uh, 
understanding the, the Hebrews reading this, they would have understood that uh, when Sennacherib was prostrating, he's got his face down. I mean, he's a target, right? His easy kill at this point, when he's down like this, that's when Adramalek and Sherezer uh, take care of him, uh, take him out. Um, so another point about this verse is this shows you how this is also being done in pagan temples as well, not just in uh, the Jerusalem temple, the temple of the Jews. This was throughout the Middle Eastern culture. No matter who your God was, whether it's Zeus or Athena, or you, you, you name your God, they would have temples, and there were temples in all these cities back then. And what you do when you go into the temple, no matter who the God is, down you go. That was a common cultural thing done at this time. Uh, here's another uh, passage. This is in Revelation. This is the New Testament where the, the angel says to John, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Now, this is how it's translated in most Bibles. Those who worship in it. And then a little later on, it says the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and prostrated to God. Now this word here in the Greek is identical to this word here. So why would you switch? They're definitely on their faces. They're definitely falling down and they're doing it to God and they're in the temple. Uh, there's, there's just no other way to translate this than to say measure the temple of God and those who prostrate in it. When you understand prostration is this very significant religious act. Uh, here's another one. This is in the New Testament. This is actually in 1 Corinthians 14 that we talked about last week. This is the one passage in the New Testament that has the most information about what Christians ought to be doing in their assemblies. But Paul in this passage, he raises the hypothetical situation of an outsider who comes into a Christian assembly. <clears throat> and he says, if all the Christians are prophesying uh, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all because he understands what they're saying. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will, your translation says, worship God, declare that God is really among you. Notice again, all these prostration indicators here. He's falling, he's on his face and he's doing it because he thinks God is there. And if God is there, the only way to respond to that is down you go. You get it? Uh, the argument going on here in 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking about the inappropriateness of speaking in tongues without tongues being interpreted. Because if the outsider comes in and sees a bunch of people speaking in another language and nobody's translating this, he's going to say, you are all crazy. But prophecy, which is speaking to people so they understand it and they're actually helping people, that's how they get convicted and that's how this thing, this reaction happens by this outsider. So interestingly enough, in this situation, it's not Christians who worship, if you want to use that word, Christians don't, but it's the outsider who prostrates to God when he sees a very meaningful assembly taking place to uh, interpret that a little bit for you. So, to, to summarize some of this, biblical proskuneo worship is this. It's a physical act. It's not an emotion. You look at all 204 times in the Old Testament and all 61 in the New Testament, it's not talking about an emotion. But we tend to think about, why well, I was worshiping God and I had my eyes closed and I had my hand raised, so... And some of I really squint really hard, then I can rather conjure up even some more worship than I had just a few seconds ago. Uh, it, it's, it's, as if, it's as though it's this internal thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to manufacture it. But biblically, proskinesis is a very physical, observable act. It's actually a type of greeting. Uh, it's never identified in the New Testament as a Christian act, something that Christians do. There's this interesting verse in uh, Revelation 19.10 and also in the, the, the last chapter, 22.9, John, a, an angel comes up to the Apostle John and John sees this angel. What does he do? 
down he goes. And the angel said, you must not do that. You prostrate only to God. As it's translated in our Bibles, worship God. But it's not saying worship, it's saying prostrate. to God is the only one to whom that act should be given. And there's, uh, it seems like I had a whole bunch more on this. Uh, maybe it's coming up later. <laughs> This is one passage where you may have heard the word worship used uh, in reference to what Christians ought to be doing. This is John chapter 4. Uh, J Jesus is having this discussion with the Samaritan woman at the, at the well. And she sees, <clears throat> they both can see the Samaritan temple in, right in the distance up on Mount Gerizim. And she throws a question at Jesus once she realizes that this guy knows something. She says, what's... You Jews, you worship, no, you prostrate in Jerusalem while we Samaritans do it in, in Mount Gerizim, uh, which is right. Well, Jesus says the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. The God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, the word worship is throughout that passage, <clears throat> but why do we think that this is talking about a Christian assembly. There is nothing in the context. It is Jesus standing at a, at a well in Samaria, and they're looking up at Mount Gerizim, and they're comparing temples, the Jerusalem one and the, and the uh, uh, Samaritan one. Uh, why do we think that this is talking about Christian uh, gatherings? As I ask here, there's no reason to assume that John 4 is talking about Christian assemblies. And to go back to this verse again, since this is talking about temple, proskuneo, every other time in the Old and New Testament where it talks about proskuneo in a temple, it's talking about prostration. And so I gotta think that in this passage, in John chapter four, they're talking about prostration again, even in that passage. The word worship rolls off the tongue so well there to us. And I don't know if you've been You've probably heard, how many of you have heard this verse before? Worship in spirit and truth. I, I think you, you, all of you know it so, bad, so well you don't even raise your hand. It's, it's just that common. But um, what really is it talking about? I think what Jesus is talking about here is the same thing he was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. What's really important with all the things you do, you do it with the heart and not just in, with rote uh, obedience and just not even thinking about it. Uh, if somebody strikes you on the cheek, you turn to them the other one. If somebody forces you to go one mile, you go two. You, you, you go overboard. It's what's in the heart is what's important. And that's what he, I think he is saying in this passage. Uh, by prostrating it with your spirit and truly doing it. That's spirit and truth, I think. <clears throat> so, so let's summarize this proskuneo business here. And it basically is summarized with these few words. It means to prostrate to. And it works in all 204 cases in the Old Testament and all 61 cases in the New Testament. You got 275 cases of your Bible and it works. It fits. It's consistent with the context. It's consistent with the Hebrew word Chava. Uh, and yet, Somewhere along the line, our English Bibles have gone astray. Let's talk about a second word now. Maybe I should hold off there. Questions? What's, questions about proskuneo? Yeah, Gary. Would this mean that we would not look directly at our God? That we wouldn't be face to face, eye to eye? Interesting question. I don't recall any time in all those times in the, in, the, in the Old or New Testament where they had to look away and couldn't look him in the eye, but maybe that was the case a couple of times. I don't know. Well, like Moses had to be in the crevice of the rock when he passed by. Yes. Uh, maybe that's true. The only illustration I can think of is from the movie Anchorman. <laughs> where uh, Will Ferrell tells his kid, do not look me in the eye, Head, head eyes down, eyes down. So the kids have to walk around like this all the time. 
they're not allowed to look at their, their father in the face, which is kind of what you're talking about. It's the same dynamic, uh, but uh, a hint on this. Revelation talks about proskuneo in heaven and in this uh, eschatological vision of Revelation. Uh, yes, the, the true followers of God are the ones who prostrate to God in the vision in Revelation. They perform prostration. They're falling on their faces. Um, when do, I, I, I'm just guessing here, when you get to heaven and you come face to face with God or Jesus, my suggestion is get down <laughs> <laughs> really fast. Because uh, this is this is the biblical cultural gesture. Um, now, how, how, how loose God's going to be on that whole thing, I don't know. Whether well, you got to be on your nose. You're not on your nose! Out you go to hell. I, uh, I, I, don't, I, I just don't know if that's going to happen. But Yeah. Just, anyway. So let's go to the next one. And I know that's a lot of Greek. We've got some more Greek here. This one gets just a little more complicated. Latrua is this word. The, the noun form is latreia. Uh, it is found 107 times in the Greek Old Testament, 26 times in the Greek New Testament. And of all the times that the word worship is found in the New Testament, only 9% of the time did the NASB translators translate uh, or use the word worship uh, as, as a translation of Latruo. Uh, when you see Latruo in the New Testament, only 23% of all the times it's found is it translated as worship. At least in, in typical English Bibles, it'll vary from one uh, translation to the next, NIV or ESV, KJV, whatever. But most of the time, Latruo or Latreia is translated as serve or service. Well, when I got into the, the weeds on this and started studying all, whatever, 200 cases of, of this word in the Old Testament, I found that it comes from this, this Hebrew word, abad. And this word is a, a normal word for simply to serve. And it's used in a variety of different contexts. And when the Septuagint translators translated this word into Greek, they didn't use just one word to translate it, you use several. So it has different meanings depending on the different contexts in which it is found. Latruo is one of them. Here's duluo. You may have heard of a doula. Is that uh, somebody who helps a woman with pregnant or uh, have, give birth, a doula? Is that right? Someone nod for me. I, I've never given birth to my aunt. <laughs> no, I'm not, not used to that. But it, it means to serve as a slave. Uh, later, geo is to do priestly service. Again, service is, is a key concept here, but it's priestly. Uh, ergatsomai is the word for work. Poieo, the word for to do or to make. All these different Greek words are used to translate abad in the Greek uh, Old Testament, which makes it interesting, it makes it a little more complicated figuring out what, what this word means. But you start to study all the, the times that it is found, it means this. It doesn't mean just to serve, because you know I could serve you cookies, uh, and then my wife's thumbprints are back there, they're really good uh, tonight. Uh, I could serve you cookies, but is that La Truo? No, it's not. Uh, I could serve a, a, a pitch uh, at a baseball game. Uh, the serve is used in a serve in tennis. Uh, uh, this is not La Truo. It means to serve deity. When this Greek or Hebrew word abad is found in the context of something done for God, that's when they translated it as latruo, service to God, but it's more specific than that, to serve him with sacrifice. Uh, this is probably a terrible illustration, but it's, uh, uh, it's one thing I found on the internet where, you know, the sacrifices were a common, this is what was done in the temple. This was done in all temples of all religions back then. Uh, they would have a, bring the fatted calf or brings a pigeon or whatever they bring and they throw it on the altar and they burn it. That was the job of the priests. And this whole act of serving the deity, whether it's a pagan god or the god, with sacrifice, that is 
La Trua. That was pretty fascinating to learn that. And, and here's a quick illustration about how, when it's first found in the Old Testament, in the Exodus story. You know, the, the, the Hebrews are in Egypt and they're working as slaves for Pharaoh. Uh, this is all from Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Gringo. Uh, but Moses comes before Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Well, what? He, he wants to go to worship their God. And this is what he says to Pharaoh. The reason they want to let the, my people go so that they might worship their God. So, but it is the Greek word latruo. Okay, so what does that mean? When they wanted to go worship their God at this mountain, what are you talking about? Well, they set up in pews and then they would have three songs and a prayer and pass a collection plate and, not, and none of that. It's so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And repeatedly throughout Exodus in, the, in this story, uh, it talks about Latruo meaning to sacrifice. There's one point in the story where uh, Moses says to Pharaoh, I got to take my, uh, my herds and my uh, flocks with us. My flocks of sheep and my, my herds of cattle. And Pharaoh says, no, I'm not letting you take your cattle. And Moses comes back and says, how can we worship God without our cattle? Well, you need the cattle because you got to offer sacrifice. And you're going to offer the fatted calf and burn it on the altar and several of them, more than likely. And then here goes the sheep and get the pigeons out and it's just going to roast them big time. That's what happens. Uh, but finally, uh, Pharaoh gives in to Moses and says, okay, take your cattle, I don't care. But not too many of us today think that in order for us to worship God on Sunday, we got to have our cattle with us. See, something's wrong with the word worship as it's found in the Bible. It, the translation is wrong. Uh, I want to compare latruo to later geo, which is the third word, but this is a good time to look at this because both of these terms were used to translate that Hebrew word abad, which means to serve. But these have two specific meanings. They're both similar in that they both mean service to deity. When you perform latruo, you're definitely doing something for God. You are definitely doing something in a temple, whether it's to a pagan God or to the God of Israel. Uh, but here's where they change. Latruo is an act done by non-priests. And later geo is what the priests do. When they're up there working with the, uh, um, the, the sacrifices, preparing them, getting out the showbread, making sure the candle is lit and all this stuff inside the holy place and the most holy place, the, all the stuff that they do there is, uh, is later geo. But what happens outside that holy place where anybody goes, uh, that's something the non-priests do, that's the latruo service. That's offering sacrifice, but these guys, when they're performing uh, later get oh they're performing any priestly duty there in the temple so just to translate what they did as to serve doesn't really say what's going on and I could mount up a whole bunch of verses that actually prove this case this is this is not really uh, it's not really hard to prove but again the translations today don't uh, reflect that this was a big revelation for me as I went through all these passages I found that there are two basic fundamental religious obligations to every Jew in the Old Testament. And it refers to these two words, proskuneo, prostration, and latruo, offering sacrifice. The two fundamental religious obligations of every Jew. And it comes from Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. It's actually repeated several times in the uh, Pentateuch. Three times in a year. This is God speaking, by the way. Three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, which is the temple, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Now, interestingly enough, proskuneo is not found in this verse, neither is latruo, but the concept is there. Appearing before the Lord, 
Remember the word before is one of those indicators of prostration. And they're not to come empty handed. They're supposed to bring a sacrifice. This, uh, to, to begin to get your head oriented to understand the Old Testament on the basis of Deuteronomy 16.16 16 is a very enlightening thing. These are the two fundamental duties of every male Jew. They had to go to Jerusalem, to the temple, at these three feasts, and perform those two things. Appear before the Lord, just like that prince in uh, Ezekiel 46. Down you go. Down you go, and then you get up and get out. But then you also offer your sacrifice. And you remember in, uh, in the Gospels, when Jesus, uh, the so-called cleansing of the temple, where Jesus gets upset with the guys who are buying and selling in the temple. They're selling pigeons, they're selling uh, sacrifices uh, so that the people who have traveled from far off, they're not coming empty handed. And so when they finally go into the temple to offer this to the priest and get it offered on the altar, they're be able to fulfill both these obligations uh, of every Jew. Here's another passage. The second commandment of the Ten Commandments says you shall not, now let me translate the way your Bible say, you shall not worship or serve other gods. But it's our two words, pros caneo and latruo. You shall not prostrate to other gods and you shall not, shall not serve them with sacrifices. Uh, and to do either of those things to another god is really bad. That's a serious no-no. Uh, the kinds of punishments for doing that listed in, in the entire Old Testament are astonishing. And you can have several generations of your family paying punishment for that offense. That's the big one. It's the second commandment. Deuteronomy 8.19, this is where that's sort of expressed. If you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and sacrifice to them, and prostrate to them, that's proskuneo there. I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Those two things. And did I, was that on the last verse? I guess maybe it's the next verse. I list uh, down here. Here's all the other passages that list these two things. <laughs> worship and serve with sacrifice together. Prostrate and offer sacrifice. Jesus himself cites this idea in Matthew 4. This is the temptation by, by Satan in the, uh, uh, in the desert, in the wilderness. And Satan says, if you will worship me, but if you'll bow down to me, it's prostrate again, it's postkinesis. Jesus responds says, you shall prostrate to the Lord your God and to him alone you shall sacrifice. Now again, your translations will say, you shall worship the Lord your God and to him alone you shall, him alone you shall serve it's much more specific than that in both cases. Uh, in Mark, Matthew 4, and verse 10, and also in Luke chapter 4, when the same thing is recorded, or in all these other verses. Uh, and it's a long list of them. It's just remarkable how these two things, how these two fundamental religious obligations of every Jew, of every Jew, I didn't say Christian, things change with Jesus. Uh, okay, coming back to the, the, the Matthew 2.11. This is the story again of the, the three wise men coming to see Jesus, the baby Jesus. After they came into the house, saw the child with his mother Mary, they fell down and prostrated. We know that. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know the story. You sing it every Christmas. But they're doing the two things. Prostrating. And then offering, they're not, they didn't come empty handed, but they offer a sacrifice or an offering uh, to Jesus. Sacrifices and offerings kind of fall into the same, same category. So, even in this day, I think to some way our, um, our culture does this uh, in a much briefer version. If you're to go over to somebody's house who's hosting you for dinner, you greet them at the door, in the customary way, maybe with a handshake, maybe with a hug, maybe with a kiss, depending on the relationship that you have. And then it's customary to not come empty handed. You know, uh, I have a bottle of wine. I got my wife's thumbprints. I brought them tonight. So I, whatever it is. But this 
general cultural thing has been going on around the planet for thousands of years. But uh, in the Bible, it's actual prostration when it's before somebody that's greater than you or before God, and it's an actual sacrifice. But there's more to it. The New Testament introduces a new use of this word latrua, and it's a metaphorical use of serving with sacrifice. Okay, and you're familiar, back up, uh, with this verse, Romans 12, 1, which is often cited. Paul says, he's coming to this big conclusion of his long argument in the book. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual latreia. That's the Greek word there. Now, your translations will probably say worship there. And then that's going to make us all think about what we do in church. But look at these, these, the context. It's talking about presenting, which is what you do with a sacrifice. You present it. You offer it. Sometimes that is translated as offer. It actually uses the word sacrifice and a holy sacrifice. This was also a concept from the Old Testament. Sacrifices needed to be holy. And they needed to be acceptable to God. All this language is sacrificial language, and this is your spiritual worship. Now, Paul can't say this is your latreia because it's, it's, it's a metaphorical latreia. We don't serve God with sacrifices today. I haven't brought a dead cow to, to church in a long time. Uh, but it's a spiritual thing. There's a few other verses to look at here. This one. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 13. At the end of chapter 12, the writer uses the word latreia, interestingly enough, and he uses it in a metaphorical sense. And then beginning with 13.1 through this verse, uh, he starts to identify what that is, what spiritual or metaphorical serving with sacrifice entails. And he says here at the end, he says, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name, do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Uh, so Christians are to perform latreia, but it's not literal latreia of, again, offering up a, a dead sheep, but uh, a spiritual sacrifice, offering your bodies, the of sacrifice of praise, of doing good and sharing, nothing that's that's uh, exclusively something that happens inside your assemblies, but even outside as well, uh, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So let's summarize La Truo. It means to serve with sacrifice. But again, there's a few times in the New Testament where it means it metaphorically, and you can tell uh, it means it not with a literal sacrifice, but with a, a metaphorical or a spiritual one. Now, word number three, what time is it? Is it? It's like uh, 7.27, is that what yeah, it is? Okay, like almost done. This goes really quick. Uh, and I'm not gonna do the fourth and the fifth one because this is, this is way too, I'm amazed you're still awake. You guys are nuts. Uh, later get, oh, this is where it's found 150 times in the Old Testament and only 15 in the New. But the interesting thing about of these 165 occurrences, it's translated as worship only once and that's in Acts chapter 13 and verse 2 now this statement needs to be qualified there are some translations that don't ever translate it as worship and there's some that might translate it as worship two or three times but generally it's just one time but it all comes around Acts chapter 13 and verse 2 when I <clears throat> first preached some of these conclusions back in 1977. And I made the statement that the Bible never says that we worship in church, that the purpose of gathering is to worship. Uh, 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 a dear Christian woman in, uh, in the church came up to me and said, Tom, the Bible does say we worship in church. And she brought out Acts chapter 13 and verse two, which says this. Now there were prophets and teachers at Antioch in the church that was there, there was Barnabas and Simeon and Lucius and Manan who had been brought up with Herod, and there was Saul. Now, while they were, I heard the translation she was using, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 
uh, set apart Barnabas and Saul for me to the work which I had called them. And then we had fasted and prayed and laid their hands and then they sent them out. Um, again, this, this translation is the NASB uh, of 2020. I don't know if you knew, but the New American Standard Version first came out in 1963. It was updated around 1995. They just came out with a new update to that even still is in 2020. And um, NASB tends to be more literal than the other translations that are out there. But they did away with translating this as worship. They realized there's some problems there with doing that. They were serving the Lord. But even serving is not quite right because this term, wherever it is found in the Old Testament, talks about performing priestly service. You remember the difference between latruo, this is when non-priests offer sacrifice in a temple, Later, geo is when priests do their work inside the temple. That is uh, later geo. What's going on here, back here, back up to this verse? What, is this, what does this word mean? What well, is kind of, kind of mind boggling that Luke would use later geo right here? What is he doing? Because every one of his readers would have been familiar with Jewish culture. Luke was intensely familiar with it. When he says, while they were serving like a priest to the Lord and they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said this stuff. He is essentially elevating the work of these five prophets and teachers at Antioch and saying they're basically the same as the uh, priests of old uh, of the temple. And he's elevating the distinctiveness and the stature of their work of prophecy and teaching. And he describes it with this metaphorical use of the word later geo. I don't know if what I said is clear to you, but I'm gonna move on. <laughs> and feel free to disagree, but uh, nobody really would disagree with me on this, uh, of scholars who understand that, because this is the only time out of 165 times in the Bible it's translated as worship. And does it mean what we mean when we talk about, you know, getting into the pews and doing what we do in, in church? Don't think so. Matter of fact, I know so. It does not. Um, so a summary. It means to perform priestly service. So, what's the real meaning of these terms? Proskuneo means to prostrate to. Latruo means to serve with sacrifice. Later, geo means to perform priestly ministry. Sebomai, which we didn't get to, and you can thank me later, means to revere and threskeia, which is only translated as once as uh, worship in some translations, actually means religion. Uh, I don't know, I'm gonna force myself not to talk about those because uh, somebody will have to kill me because it's terribly boring. But you did well putting up with all this tonight. So to recap, these first points that we started with tonight that we ended last night with, why didn't they have worship services in the early church? They didn't describe their meetings as worship. They didn't describe their meetings as services. They called their meetings gatherings and their meetings were horizontally focused. They didn't use these worship words because they just simply didn't apply. When Christians got together, when they walked in the door of somebody's house, remember these are house churches, they didn't all drop down and perform prostration. There's no indication that that happens. There's actually in second century literature uh, one Christian writer who says, we don't do that. Our people don't do that. That's a pagan thing that is done. Pagans do that. We don't do that. We, he, he makes a sermon out of this thing. We keep our eyes upward. We don't look down to where the demons live. That's what this, this writer says in the second century. Obviously getting carried away with his sermoning, sermonizing there. Uh, so that's what's going on there. That's what we're talking about, the assembly, and uh, how we got worship wrong. Now, I suspect you have some questions and I'm, uh, comments and maybe some objections. I'm all, all ears. <laughs>